It's February 27, 1996, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. True to its name, Pokemon is an absolute monster of a media entity. The world's third best-selling video game series, the most successful ever video game to TV adaptation, and the highest-selling trading card game in history of cards. And it all began today in history in 1996 with the release of two Game Boy games that Nintendo wasn't at all confident about, Pokemon Red and Pokemon Green. Yeah, and if you're listening from the US or Europe, you may be thinking, no, 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 you've made a mistake right up the front. It's Pokemon mm. Red and Blue. But no, in Japan it was called Red and Green, but they renamed it Red and Blue, supposedly to appeal to a US audience by choosing the colours that were on the United States flag. That's yeah, hilarious. but that, that is a really established part of American culture, isn't it? You've got the Democrats and the Republicans, you've got yeah. it on the flag, Red and Blue. Does that mean that people with certain political sympathies would only get their children the red one or the blue one? <laughs> <laughs> well, the genius, I think, of Pokemon right from the beginning is that ideally the target consumer would buy both. Right, yes. You could only collect all the pocket monsters if you got both games. So, no, you wouldn't pick a side. You'd get both. Well, I suppose the other way that you could go about getting all of the, you know, got to catch them all, getting all of the Pokemon was by actually interfacing with your friend. And this was part of Satoshi Tajiri's uh, inspiration, aside from his youthful interest in collecting insect species, was that he was just really he, sort of compelled by the idea that uh, Game Boy had come out with a relatively new thing that you could do, which was link up two uh, Game Boy consoles to one another. And through that, then you could trade with your friends yeah, I think that's such an important detail. The idea only came to him because Nintendo had created that USB link mm. between the two Game Boys. I remember how exciting that was when I was 11 playing Tetris with my friends and you could send lines over to each other. Yeah. And it's amazing that from something so seemingly small, this little technological shift that Nintendo put, that tiny little in iteration in, in what people were expecting, sparked an idea in the brain of someone like Tijari to think... Literally, the idea came to him visualising in his mind little monsters walking over the wire between the two Game Boys. Mm. And from <laughs> that, this multi-billion dollar brand was created. Mm. Yeah, but he was savvy enough to realise that most kids probably wouldn't be that excited about a bug collecting game. So he cast his mind about for what the collectibles would actually be. And he found his inspiration in a 1960s Japanese sci-fi show called Ultra 7, in which the heroes used capsule monsters that look very much like Pokeballs. And actually, his original title idea was Capsule Monsters. Just ran into, you know, they went through quite a few name changes. That one, I assume, was probably a bit of a copyright issue. And at this point, Tajiri was a relatively well-known figure in the Japanese gaming industry. After he left university he had contributed to gaming magazines and then started his own fanzine called Game Freak in 1981 he started out writing it by hand and stapling it together it contained the kind of things that you used to find in gaming magazines easter eggs and walkthroughs it brought up a big audience the biggest selling issue sold 10,000 copies I assume by that point he wasn't handwriting them anymore and it attracted contributors including Ken Sugimori who would go on to illustrate the original Pokemon lineup and in 1989 the pair of them made the genius move of just transforming Game Freak into a games development company, you know, capitalising on the goodwill that they already had. Yeah, so he knew that Pokemon was this passion project that he wanted to drive forward, but because his was an untested studio first, they worked on a bunch of other games, which, you know, Nintendo entrusted them with because they were sufficiently within the gaming community. But that's cool, by the way, isn't it? You know, that's like Hollywood Studios letting nerds who blog about right. Star Trek direct Star Trek, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, which probably speaks to where the industry was at the time, you know, that it was still a place that was being not only kind of driven by, but also inhabited by fanboys. But so the first projects that they worked on were a game called Pulse Man. Uh, Yoshi uh, was their first really big hit. And then they also worked on Mario and Wario, all of which did well. But really, they were kind of just uh, the effort of Tajiri to uh, prove that he his studio was capable of putting out games that were going to be well resolved but also sell and even so at the point at which he came to Nintendo with his idea about a game where you go around catching little monsters in the wilderness they weren't entirely convinced the success of this brand was so unexpected 
that this was a domestic-only release. There wasn't an English-language version ready to go. Yeah. By the time Pokemon Red and Blue was ready for release in the US, it was already a huge hit in Japan. They already had the first set of Pokemon cards had been released in October 1996 in Japan. And also the anime, the, the TV show, had been airing for a while, including the infamous December 1997 episode, which used photosensitive light flickering, and it holds the record for the most epileptic seizures caused by a TV <laughs> show. Great 685 fact. children. That's going straight in the Christmas quiz, by the way. Oh, You'll good. forget, okay. but just... 685. You know, yeah, 685. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that episode was never shown abroad or ever repeated in Japan, understandably. But despite that setback, it had become a huge phenomenon in Japan. And so Nintendo, looking ahead to the US release, they spent $20 million on pre-release publicity, including an airdrop of 1,000 stuffed Pikachus over Topeka, Kansas, which now I'm saying out loud, I (laughs) realise that's why they chose it. (laughs) Yes, indeed, yes. I mean... It's interesting. I I sort of, I'm going to guess, Arian, that you're the same as me. Generationally fell between the gaps here. Yeah. I was already too old by 1998 to be interested in this, but I was also too young to have kids of my own and discover it that way. So genuinely, I know this makes me sound really ignorant uh, to people who've downloaded this episode because they're well into the Pokemon universe. I didn't know it was a video game first until I started researching today. It's such a successful multi-platform brand Mm. that I have engaged with casually uh, you know, as trading cards, video games, anime, merchandise, I, I wouldn't know that it was a Game Boy game before it was anything else. Yeah. I think the cards were what really caused the hysteria, though, definitely in my childhood recollection, you know, in sort of 99, 2000, when they were really big. I mean, I was slightly too old for them, but my younger brothers had Pokemon cards and everyone at school had Pokemon cards. This was like the height of Pokemon cards being banned. This seems to be what really took the hysteria to a new level because, you know, once you you can only ask your parents for the game once, right? And if they buy it for you, you've got it. The cards, you had to keep buying them, especially because they would put, I don't know what they're called, but I know we always just called them shinies, the special cards. Cards that would be included in some packs. But it led to these scenes where kids, instead of buying them and saying, Wow, thanks, Mum and Dad, were just ripping them open, looking through them, seeing if they had any cards that they didn't already have, seeing if they had any shinies, and if they didn't have anything, just tossing them to one side. Cue widespread fear and the 1999 front page story of Time magazine calling it, <laughs> quote, a pestilential Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it actually became a lawsuit in September 1999. Two mothers from Long Island, Marcy Imber and Janet Silverman led a lawsuit against Nintendo claiming that the card game was akin to a a lottery and that their presumably mortified nine-year-old sons had become gambling addicts. (laughs) I'm sure that's a plot line from South Park. (laughs) I mean, for something that is in press coverage from the time talked about as if it's a meme or a trend, it's astonishing looking back on it actually what a slow burn it was. Yeah. I mean, by the end of the century, Nintendo had announced that the game had earned $5 billion, which at the time was the size of the entire US video game industry. But it happened over a number of years and a slow build. And that's why I think when Pokemon Go came out in 2016, you had this uh, generation of millennials ready to be tapped for nostalgia. Mm. But also, like, the general universe of the characters hadn't disappeared The TV show was still being aired in dozens of countries all around the world. People knew the characters, if only from the T-shirts. You know, I found an article from Foreign Policy in 2002, which talked about Pokemon hegemon. You know, (laughs) that the soft power of Pokemon was actually Japan's main way of infiltrating the West. That's brilliant. (laughs) I mean, not everyone was a fan, though. Aside from the annoyed teachers who were banning Pokemon cards from their school, also it attracted the ire of Christian conservatives in the US. Not just because of the monsters. You're thinking, oh, it's the monsters. It's the Harry Potter thing again. It's too much like magic. That was part of it. But also the fact that the franchise gave credence to the concept of evolution. You know, yes. Pokemon evolve yeah. into different forms. Just like the evolution lies that their kids are being taught in public school. Um, Also the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. In 2001, he issued a fatwa against the Pokemon franchise, claiming it promoted Zionism, Christianity and Freemasonry through (laughs) use of imagery like stars, crosses and triangles, and that it encouraged gambling. Curiously, you could still watch Pokemon in Saudi Arabia, but only in English. (laughs) So they just didn't translate (laughs) it so that people didn't understand the hidden polytheism (laughs) within. (laughs) It was also banned in Sweden. Sweden, and for a sort of related but different reason to the whole business of it being too much like gambling, for Sweden, it was too much like advertising because the TV show was pretty much 
pushing stuff that you could buy. And eventually they, I, I don't know how they quite relented, but they did decide to relent and lift the, their own fatwa on the show. Um, <laughs> but you never hear the phrase, got to catch them all, because they they still determined that that, that was too much like a stealth form of <laughs> advertising, so telling children make, what to do. Do they, do they just make them say a different thing every single time so it can't become a marketable catchphrase? <laughs> yeah, catch them all if you have <laughs> enough money and when the fun stops, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Be happy with the amount you've caught. Feels very yeah. Swedish, doesn't it? Yeah. Tomorrow. He said, The instant I saw the picture, my mouth fell open and my pulse began to race. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.